think we, we can just kind of jump in. So, hey, welcome everybody. To, uh, this is our our weekly conversation with artists, and our special guest today is none other than Chris Roberti. Uh, Chris is you may know Chris from High Maintenance and Broad City, and uh, he very uh, I, I, to me the most amazing thing. I mean, there's a lot, you know that, that's all amazing stuff. I don't mean to downplay that, but uh, downplay. Chris just uh, wrote, directed produced and acted in uh, a film called Same Boat. That was a fascinating project that, uh, Chris, how do they, how do folks see that now? Is it? Uh... You can see it, it's, um, you have to pay for it, right? So it, it's on, I think, Amazon and iTunes and things like okay. that. It, All right. I think there's like sameboatmovie.com. Yeah. We'll lead you, and the hope is that maybe, cause, um, it premiered online, I think like April 7th or something, April 4th. Yeah. And I guess the hope is that it'll go into streaming. So you don't well, have to pay, add, pay more money for it. Really. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I recommend that you see this film for many reasons, but one of the most fascinating things about this film is, is the making of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so Chris, can you, can, can you just walk us through that? Sure. Uh, um, what did so, you do? <laughs> my friend and partner in the film, uh, Josh Itzkowitz, uh, he produced a film I was in, I don't know, five or six years ago that was shot in part at a real music festival. And they had gotten waivers from everybody at the festival that we could shoot in it. And then he came to me and said, would you want to make a movie on a cruise ship? Um, and I said, yeah. And so, you know, we wrote a movie and the idea was that we were gonna shoot it in secret on a real cruise ship um, because you don't have to pay the cast and crew. Well, you don't, you don't have to pay for room and board. You don't have to worry about room and board. It's all kind of baked in to the, the price of the ticket, which is like, I don't know, a hundred to 200 bucks per person. Um, so we wrote like this big kind of heist, zany heist movie and we took a, um, a test cruise where we did a lot of like scouting and we realized that we could totally shoot a movie on the boat, but we couldn't shoot the movie we had written. And then, so then on the boat, we basically began to write the story of Same Boat, which is uh, a time traveling assassin falls in love with the person he's supposed to kill. Mm -hmm. um, wait, so, no, wait, 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 wait. I have so many questions about this. Come on now. So <laughs> you said that you, couldn't do the script you wrote, meaning like you had written a script for another occasion. We wrote, well, we wrote a script with the crews in mind. Um, and the kind of plan was if, if the script, if we liked the script enough, then we would take a test cruise basically. Um, and we wanted to test audio equipment and kind of just get a sense of what, what the cruise was like. Could we shoot there? What are the different locations on a boat? Um, and we did that and we, we quickly realized that nobody really cares what you're doing. There's no <laughs> one like watching you and saying, Hey, you can't make a movie here because I right. think it's like, why would anybody do that? Um, <clears throat> now, wait a minute. Were you, did you have booms and everything? No, no. We, no. we didn't want to use any booms. We wanted to be as sort of, you know, fly on the wall or invisible as possible. So we brought lobs with transistors or transmitters and there was a lot of interference. So that was a lesson we learned on the test. And then when we went back, we kind of devised this plan that recorded right into our pack um, so that there would be no interference. Uh -huh. But oh. and we had a boom. So you all like, had separate, totally separate recordings. Yeah. That you put together in post. Yeah. So there was no synced recording. <sighs> I don't think so. We would we would start the camera in a cabin. If the times we were shooting outside, like in public, we would start the camera in a cabin and maybe we would mark it and then we would walk to the location. So not okay. people aren't saying action or rolling. Okay. Kind of always going. And okay. then, you know, we would we kind of made a code word for action which was cruising. Cruising. So, <laughs> um but yeah, like I said, nobody really cared. Did you, did you, would you say take numbers or anything like that? 
It's possible. I don't remember. I think You're we would cruising. just keep it rolling. Right. Cruising. Yeah. We wouldn't really name it. Inside, we would, you know, Do we had a little like no budget slate on a camera that we would. Yeah. What? Um, but the sound hate, was just. Oh, go ahead. I hate like man on the street stuff or being in public. I just get very filled with anxiety about doing stuff there, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, so it was nice as kind of the director, one of the people in charge, I could say I could not make myself do anything too uncomfortable. Right. right. And so, so you slate in the room, mm -hmm. you got now every, and everybody just starts their own recording. Yeah, I think that's how it happened. And we would check each other to make sure that the, so my Josh again, who was like a genius, he thought, well, we do the the kind of, I think there were task cams, so we record it into our pack. This and is then, like a genius criminal, but he really, I mean, he's so unassuming, but um, he he is he's brilliant. Um, but then he wanted to be able to monitor sound, mm -hmm. so he kind of finagled this Bluetooth transmitter from the pack, so that whoever was doing sound and i mean the crew was like two and a half people it was yeah. our dp darren kwan yeah josh and then jeff seal who was an actor so when he wasn't acting he was monitoring sound mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it. the and this whoever was monitoring sound was getting the sound feed from all the individual packs that people were carrying. yeah they would just like switch every once in a while to see what it was worth yeah, wow. this movie is so amazing because here you took this idea, you get on a cruise ship, you uh, film this uh, movie in all kinds of uh, different locations on the cruise ship, yeah. and uh, and then you put it together, you finish it, and it's it's amazing. It's, it's out there. Oh, thank you. It's amazing. And it's thank it's you. cohesive and it looks great. Uh, um, did the um, did. So no releases for for all the other no. folks, or we we made sure to try to not, you know, get anybody, yeah, uh, close too clear, um, and we you know we we've talked to lawyers, yeah, since then to make sure that we're kind of in the clear and yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, actually, I was I one of the <laughs> zillion things I was impressed by in this film was that was I was paying attention to that and I noticed that, gee, somehow. The background is is there, but they're not featured at all, and so yeah. you you wouldn't pick out anybody, and yet it's clear that it's happening on a boat, and that yeah. there's a population there. And in fact, the only exception was the, the time you the shot table. the. Right. There was a thing that you shot in the dining room with the waiters dancing. Oh on the yeah. <laughs> Which I'm guessing, because uh, co completely coincidentally. Lee and I were on the same cruise. The carnival cruise. And the reason that we know we were on the same cruise is we recognized the waiter. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Our table, okay. our table was right where your table was. It was kind of amazing. But I'm guessing that when they were doing that, it was you were taking out your your whatever you were shooting with, and yeah. everybody else was shooting too. Because they're waiting. Told, I mean, everyone has a camera. You know, right. we shot on a Sony A7S, I think, which looks just like a you know like a DSLR, like a regular still camera. And That's so amazing. everyone is taking pictures like that, yeah. you know. All the time. You know, one yeah. of the things that, um, that you've said, which a sentence which is really sticks with me, which I love so much, which I've kind of stolen is uh, finishing power. Mm. And yeah. I love so, I love that so much when you go, oh, but you have to have finishing power. And I go, oh my gosh, that's an amazing sentence. And, and so many artists were always trying to help people inspire to get these projects started. And, you know, sometimes it might take a long time for things to get started and then you don't like it and it doesn't quite finish or it doesn't come to, uh, it doesn't get completed. And I love, uh, I love that sentence. Could you talk a little bit more about your, that sentence for, for us? Yeah. Um, Our. my friend and great teacher, Ali Faranakian, who kind of runs the people's improv theater. Um, he's from Iran or he, his parents are from Iran. And so he said he, his mother would say to him, Ali, you don't have finishing power because he would be interested in a bunch of different things. And so she was saying, you stick to just the one thing until it's done. Uh -huh. And I also, he said, he, he thinks it has something to do with like rowing or sailing that you want enough power to make it on land. To finish. Um, uh -huh. So if just if the idea is just like, 
finish it, you know, and I think he would also say the hardest thing is to start something. The second hardest thing is to finish something. Right. And I think that's been totally true for me. And so, you know, we kind of, in this project and then in subsequent projects, the idea is it's better to be done than good. That being able to just, you know, kind of send it out. Right. The top priority. Because right. I have a ton of projects too that are just like, kind of died on the table or on the vine or whatever. Right. And right. Um, it's disheartening. I think finishing builds momentum to finish more stuff. And it okay. tells other people, oh, this is somebody, if I volunteer my day to be with them, that, that they're going to, it's going to get out there. It's exactly. something that will be shareable and not just like stay on a hard drive somewhere. Right, right. And so sometimes that really is, uh, you know, taking your idea, uh, getting it out there and then just finishing it. Just yeah. Said, I love that. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Well, in this recently, I did the, the artist's way, right. which I'm Good. sure maybe many of you have yeah. heard about and um, maybe were cynical. I was cynical about it, but I, I did it and I loved it. And one of the things that Julia Cameron says is that you, by, as artists, our job is to take care of quantity mm -hmm. and God's, she goes into what God means, but whatever, takes care of the quality. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it, it is a nice freeing feeling of like, um, it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be done. And even if I, even the things that I really have tried to make good and finished often don't turn out as well as the things that I don't maybe put that minute care into and right. finish. So I think you were also talking, excuse me, um, uh, you were also talking about another teacher of yours, uh, um, um oh the playwright good times are killing oh linda berry linda berry that yeah. uh she was uh you know that she would go a drawing is a drawing and it even if it's a bad drawing it's still a drawing even if it's a bad drawing it's about you know drawing it it is it is its thing it's its own thing it's out in the world and yeah. uh, so you just got to keep doing it although it's funny like for me there's a sort of a dance that happens between quantity and quality because Quality for me is exceedingly important, and yeah. uh, and so I think it's it's like finding that balance point where you you're not so worried about quality that you're in any way uh, squashing your productivity, mm -hmm. um, and then on the other side of that, you're not just producing anything; you really are constantly turning your attention on how can I make this better and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But it is a really interesting finding that finding that balancing point, I think is yeah. really interesting. And I, I feel like I've definitely been on either side of that. Yeah. I've either been, you know, like I'm, I'm putting out stuff, but I'm not paying enough attention to quality. And it, it's just something I was dissatisfied with about that. Or the other side where I'm so attentive to quality that it's squashed. Nothing's, nothing's coming out. You know? Yeah. Um, I, I think this is for me having kind of collaborators. It's helpful in that realm. Um, in what sense? That I can kind of get out of my head when I need to, or I can, you know, it just as someone to bounce things off of, and maybe they're worried about a different set of quality or than you are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's nice to have even when one you, or two other people. The uh, the high maintenance and broad city were you were you involved with both of those projects at their nascence when they when they began high maintenance i was kind of in i was on it was in early when it was still a web series uh-huh broad city i had done a movie with ilana glazer in fact like one of the first nights we were shooting she like found out that she had been picked up by fx at the time and then it went to comedy central so we were kind of friends before in the early days, but I was never involved with Broad City until the like the third or fourth season, I think, and just for one episode. Oh, but I High Maintenance, I was it was it's been nice. I was when it was like a small crew of maybe four or five people, when it was just on uh, a web series. Then when it got to Vimeo, the crew expanded. I think they had a budget of like I don't even know what it was, it's like seventy thousand or a hundred thousand dollars an episode or something. And then now it's on HBO, it's just expanded even more and kind of money is no object. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you feel like, you, what's your takeaway? I mean, in, in the case then of, of high maintenance where you're watching it develop, 
uh, as you're participating in it. What's your takeaway about these um, these projects that that start not in the old fashioned way of some sort of studio or network financing something and, and doing it, but rather they're, they're starting in a kind of a grassroots way and then finding their way into a system. And I, I'm just thinking that, you know, I, I can't speak for everybody watching this, this interview, but uh, I can speak for myself and I'm certainly really interested in how that happens. Yeah. I often get questions about, you know, how do you do that? And, and how do you do that? Uh, well, I think in their cases, they had a really beautiful, interesting, unique thing. And the world was like lining up with it in another way, both like that high maintenance was a, a weed show, but it wasn't about, you know, stoners. Right. Um, and that this kind of young, vibrant voice from Broad City was just like ready to kind of kind of take over the culture. So I think there were two things happening kind of parallel. And that's when you have these like amazing stories. I know tons of people who are making cool stuff, but it's just, you know, it doesn't catch on or, or whatever. Yeah. So I think there's a, in terms of how do I make something that kind of goes all the way to the top? It's, I don't think it's worth even thinking about. Right. right. The other thing though, and even like Ben and Katya would say, about high maintenance is like, oh, this is their art project. And to think of it as yeah. something that nourishes them and, um, you know, that wasn't going to, they didn't kind of tie any unreasonable hopes, I think, to it. That's right. my impression. And I love, I love that, that it nurtures the artist. It's nurturing, yeah. and if you're nurturing the artist, then you're kind of putting that out into the world. And um, so that you're letting that go but you're nurturing the artist first uh yeah. you're creating something you're nurturing yourself and then putting it out there i think i think my experience in in as an as a performer or, or director or whatever uh is is that is is like this um my my unrealistic expectations and hopes were dashed so hardly, so quickly <laughs> that I was like, "Well, screw that! I, I just got to put my attention on." And and I, that really is the is what happened. I think for me, yeah. I just thought, I thought, you know, I was never one of these people that really like, "I'm someday I'm gonna," you know, it wasn't like that. But I really, I obviously had some career aspirations in, in some sense. And, and uh, oh, our dog is protecting us from birds. <laughs> they're 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 so they're deadly. There's some danger. Um, um, maybe maybe we take him out outside. What do you think? Um, so uh, so what what I think what happened for me is that you know as, as I would start to dream or fantasize about these things and everything and, and place attach these hopes to any particular projects, you know I'd experienced. Uh, a, while I might experience some some degrees of of something that would constitute success, I'd also experience these disappointments and sadnesses, mm. and I I really didn't have much of a stomach for those sadnesses, and I just went, you know, I I, I'll just do the stuff without worrying about what it will become. Yeah, I'll just do it, um, and I find that much more comfortable. Yeah, but I, I I agree. I, I feel those feelings of rejection and sorrow and oh i wish i would have or maybe if i would have those regrets or whatever but it, it all like i think working on something is like the antidote for that all the time yeah um, even if it's something small again that you know i i had i did this series maybe a year ago called a humane society which were it was like in my head it was just like a monthly weird magazine of my brain web series and some, like the longest one was like three and a half hours long. You know, we weren't trying to go viral or do anything. Mm -hmm. And even in not trying, I was like, maybe someone is going to discover me and this is going to be my ticket to whatever I think I wanted. But, um, but it always feels good to be doing something and finishing. And I think the place that I got to at the end of that project was, okay, maybe this will be my life. You know, I'll, I'll do little things when I can and, you know, be with my wife and my daughter when I can and you know um because I, the people I know who are very successful I'm sure it's the same for you are just as happy or unhappy as anybody else oh, for sure. and often less happy mm -hmm. yeah. 
the the uh, when these projects start, um, you know, you mentioned a budget figure at, at one point, but I'm wondering, like, from your experience, what what are the budget figures for these for at startup? Like when 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 something is being done as a if someone's creating either a webisode right. or or something, what's the range of budgets for those things that, in your experience? My advice would be don't pay for anything. Um, often we have to pay for sound. Yeah. Um, because we don't know how to, like, so I have a, like a production family called Bankrupt and I don't know, six or so years ago, we were like, let's just get together and have like basically a film school and we, our goal was just to release a, a video a week for a year. Um, and we learned editing and we learned, you know, camera kind of, we had little specializations, but sound was something that we needed someone else to do. And so we wound up usually paying for sound, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pay for food for people. Mm -hmm. um, but it really, I, I've been involved and seen lots of projects where people spend thousands of dollars, like on their first project i guess with the hope of like someone at a network will see it and then just like put that on tv i really i've never seen it happen i can't advise that it might get you other jobs but i think you know i don't know if that second or third or fourth job will at all make up for what you've made but um so i you know i try to work as cheaply as possible and again while still making something look good and um watchable so, and that's the, that's the, one of the things with sound that you can watch something that looks bad, but sounds good much easier than you, than looks good and sounds bad. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. everybody I know says the same thing. Sound yeah. is the thing. Mm -hmm. sound is yeah. the thing that matters. And what about, um, uh, obviously if you're wanting to work with union actors, you have to work out those, those kind of sag low budget things and all of those things. And, yeah. and, uh, but do you find that the unions are pretty um, understanding of, of and, and in some way supportive of startup projects? Um, I don't know. Well, for Same Boat, for instance, we wanted to do it through whatever, SAG Ultra Low, the, the yeah. cheapest thing you could do. And I think it's like, I don't know what we had to pay everybody. It was maybe like $200 or, or something, mm -hmm. yeah. whatever. Um, but we lied. We, we lied. We said we were doing a short film in Miami and we did and we paid them. So we had the the, te the whatever the check stubs and then they paid us back as an investment in the film. Um, and we got a call while we were at sea from the Miami SAG basically saying, hey, can we come and do a, a set visit? <laughs> <laughs> and we were we were just like oh my god I can't believe we're like in international waters what is you know what could happen um, we thought about like creating a whole fake production for them to come and see but it just it blew over I don't know I mean I totally support the union it was just, it would have been pro we would not have been able to make it and yeah. so in general um, the stuff that I've been making is you know just non-union non-union yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done some uh, yeah. some uh, low budget projects there. Uh, as an actor, I've done a ton of low budget projects, but yeah. uh, I, I've been involved with producing things at the very, you know, at ultra low budgets. And I find it actually is doable. It's just a lot yeah. of paperwork. Yeah. But but it doesn't it doesn't tend to for the ultra low stuff. It doesn't tend to, uh, you know, raise the overall budget much. Yeah. It's not that much money. Um, that's interesting. And then one of the things I was fascinated with is, you know, so the first, I think it was the first thing I asked you after I saw the film. I was like, how on earth did you do that without worrying about carnival cruises uh, yeah. coming after you? And you had a very interesting answer, I thought. <laughs> but we said that it would be good. It would be good publicity. You know, it's similar to <laughs> Escape from Tomorrow, which was shot in Disney World secretly. <laughs> And I feel like this whole interview is illegal. I, I don't know. Why. I, yeah, I I don't know how I've incriminated myself. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't They're all know. coming with me. Screen Actors Guild. That's right. I know, really. But um, so we digitally erased any carnival logo sign. Logos. Right. Yeah, there were no. It would be there. obvious. I mean, it's so obvious that I recognize the smokestack and the waiters. Like I said, <laughs> it's I mean, probably was... trademarked that smokestack somewhere. <laughs> 
Um, but we thought if someone were going to come after, like we don't kind of disparage carnival or do anything illegal. If no, anything, there are, there are passages that seem like an ad. Yeah, um, completely. And so we thought like, if it was going to be worth their time to come after us, that would be good. That would be, right. you know, people would be like, oh, this is the movie that Carnival tried that doesn't want you to see or whatever. Yeah. Um, but and you're so, else. you're so, uh, I don't know if this is the right word, but I, the word that's coming to mind is brazen, that you're so brazen about it that literally in the credits, it says something to the effect of this film was yeah. shot in stealth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on, a, on a cruise line. You don't say right. Carnival Cruise, right? Well, no. Well, I think people didn't believe it. The, I think the first, we thought that would get make people want to watch it. And we were like, this is like a big selling point. And for whatever reason, I think in the first festival, we were in Cinequest and someone asked like, they didn't know. And yeah. so we're like, we have to really make sure people know that this was shot without permission. And so we put it in the credits. And even then, I think people still kind of doubt it. Which is yeah, great. because it, 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 I mean that's the, the thing. Testament it, looks to Darren like a, it looks like a regular movie. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It, does yeah. it doesn't look like you know this knockoff, you know, cheapo thing at right. all. Yeah, that's, that's great. Good Thank good you. Job. Right, well, yeah. and you're charming in it. I mean, such you know, your yeah. acting is like wonderful. And uh, and and how did you come up with the uh, the idea? Or like my question in these is like, what you know, yeah. what inspires you as an artist? Or um, yeah, or how do you keep yourself inspired? You're doing the artist mm. way, which is um, yeah. wonderful. You're doing, you're taking charge by doing these little projects. But yeah. um, this particular project, what what inspired you to tell this story? This, well, it was, it's interesting because it was a total outside in. Josh was like, do you want to make a movie on a boat? And I was like, sure. And so I had no real, I didn't care about the story at first. So I was just kind of thinking about what could happen. But the more time I spent with it, the more I liked it and the more I believed in it, which was interesting. Uh -huh. And I mean, you know, I think that also let me be like, not precious with it. At every right. stage it was like, well, this is, a, you know, this is kind of a stunt or an exercise. Yeah. But when we were on the boat, I forget, maybe one of us was like, wouldn't it be terrible to break up with someone the first night of a cruise because it's such close quarters. And so we thought, oh, that could, that maybe could be the movie. And then I was like, oh, we could do like a, an assassin falls in love with the person who's going to kill, you know, they kill. The idea was like, they kill people on vacation because on vacation people are disoriented and, you know, if they disappear, nobody and, will know for a and while. the premise is, as I recall, is that they kill people, it be, they're from the future and they kill people right. that, that be, because they're trying to correct basically things that happen in history that cause very bad things to happen. Right. And, and so they figure out, gee, if that person was, was not alive, they never would have given birth to this person who ended up destroying the world and right. stuff like that, right? But ver on a very bureaucratic kind of disappointing level. Um, and in that, like, so there's a scene where they're like, well, how come you didn't kill Hitler? And then we say, well, we tried so many times, but kind of history sometimes has these points that, you know, the kind of analogy is like when there's when the bad kid is absent from school someone else steps up into that role mm -hmm. that there are these sort of you know gravity wells that things will happen so you can't really change history that much but the further you go from these epicenters maybe you can nudge it mm -hmm. yeah. and i i used to like the the thing that i was thinking about with this was when i was a, a school teacher kind of that feeling of wanting to do good but also kind of being beaten down by failure and dreams of like escaping, you know? So it was, I think of it almost as a real career, the, the kind of the question that um, the assassin are, is dealing with were questions I was having for, about being a teacher or kind of committing to being an artist more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that, that kind of got pretty personal. Mm -hmm. And when you were doing it, uh, when you played festivals and stuff and people eventually did find out how it was made, mm -hmm. did you just get a ton of questions that are sort of like the questions we were asking, like, how did you do it and stuff like but, that? Yeah, they were, I mean, we, so they're very impressed, um, yeah, well, which feels nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's impressive. You know, we shot, we shot about 90 pages in seven days. I know. Unbelievable. Um, how long was post-production? Too long. Um, <laughs> but you finished it. We did. 
Was it? Uh, that was the lesson. That that's a big lesson. Was that we kind of didn't um, we didn't have enough gas in the tank to finish in the as quickly and with as you know with as much momentum as we wanted. Mm -hmm. So I mean, well, how how seriously? How long was the post? Like a year and a half, maybe. Wow. Not. Oh. I mean, you know, again, for shooting something like we wrote it in a year or less. Mm -hmm. We shot it in you know basically two weeks. Well, yeah, two weeks with oh, two cruise weeks. stuff. But um, so it's a two week it, cruise. It was a one week cruise that we took back to back. The same cruise, oh. like leaves on a Monday afternoon, gets back first thing on Friday morning. Cause it, and it stops in Key West and Cozumel, Mexico. And so we wanted to have the safety in case, because uh -huh. you have these little windows of time at those locations. Um, and that we kind of swapped some cast out um, in the week in between. Mm -hmm. And how, um, how often did you have to do pickups where you like looked at something and went, oh, we got to do that one again? What do you mean? After we had filmed it? Yeah. Like we ne you, never, we, we couldn't, <laughs> what could we do? <laughs> Well, you could do it the next week. No. Oh, no, no, no. There was no... No way. We briefly kind of looked through footage, but nothing was... You know what? There's one scene that we knew right away that we couldn't... We, did, we almost stopped, and then we had to refilm, reshoot that. So one kind of reshoot. Uh -huh. Which and scene there was, was that? What, um, it was the scene where I'm on the side with Evan Kaufman, who plays Rob. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And we had a beautiful sunset. We were on the top deck but it was windy and there were like onlookers. It was the first thing we shot and like people were gathering around and the crew oh. were like <laughs> people who just like weren't even involved with the scene, but were with us. We're just like watching and it looked like a movie shoot. Um, and this woman was like, oh, they're shooting a movie. And I was like, we cannot do this, cannot happen. I was like, I had, you know, agita. Yeah. Um, so we reshot that and then we had to do like ADR and stuff. But in general, it was just like, go, go, go. Which I like too, again. The momentum is wow, unbelievable. Yeah, so, um, I think we should, should open, open this up. up so um, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can, uh, what you can do is uh, there's a participants button. And if you click the participants button, a little button will come up that says raise hand and you can hit that. And next to your name in the participants screen, there'll be a, uh, a blue hand that appears. And that will let us know that you have a question. Um, and then we'll invite you to, to unmute your microphone and, and turn on your video so you can ask it. So if anybody has any questions, um, in, in the meantime, I'll, you know, we'll keep asking questions, but I'm sure you have some. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's really, it's, <laughs> it is, uh, it's pretty extraordinary, Chris, what you did. Oh, there's a question. So um, Jeff Brackett, go ahead and uh, um, unmute your microphone. And there you Hi, are. And, um, what's your question? Oh, well, uh, my question is, I, I, the telling me about the artist way and like, I have some really cool quotes that you said better to be done than good. Like I personally just like really uh, resonate with that right now. Yeah. Um, just doing, doing work. And, uh, my question is as in this film, which I can't wait to watch cause I didn't, <laughs> I didn't see it, um, yet. But how was continuity in post? Like, was that was that challenging? I know you 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 know kind of yeah the seat of your pants, but there's I mean you know we had kind of like written down what day it was in within the story what day it was and what kind of um, wardrobe we were wearing. There's one main problem, um, like I'm wearing shoes in one scene and then I'm wearing flip flops. And the flip flops are kind of a thing. They're they're they play a, a small part in a scene, and I was like, oh, but whatever. You know, again, I think in general I always wore the same. Well, no, that's not true. But I had a few wardrobes. But we we're pretty good about you know kind of trying to make it as easy for us as possible. And yeah, no, but you had what, no script supervisor, right? Well, it was us. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, there wasn't anyone watching and then saying, you know, yeah. Um, Wow. You, you had the glass in your right hand or whatever. Right. Yeah. So you had to be your own script supervisor. And so when you were doing post, did you notice a lot of errors that you had to edit around or? No, I don't there think so. No, there weren't. No, I, you know, I think we got the coverage. I'm trying to think, was there anything we don't have? There was no real trouble. And even the flip-flop thing was like, I don't, it doesn't make a huge deal. You know, it, 
It doesn't I don't jump remember out the flip flop. Well, that's error. good because if we're looking at your feet, then you know I don't something know something else is going on. Be looking at something else. Yeah. What yeah. um what are you are you working on stuff right now in quarantine? Yeah, I've been reading with a few people I met oh, with nice. the Bear Group. So we have stuff going on and I have like a little show that, um, of new work that my friends made. Um, but right now I'm in this meditation class that is like finding out what you, what your life, kind of like what your life mission is type of yeah. thing. And it kind of falls back into telling my own stories. Mm -hmm. And so the thing about is, is really quite amazing. Oh. Sorry, you froze a little bit. Yeah, I froze a little bit. Um, but yeah, uh, the fact that you're talking about this and that that's what I've been talking about in this class is really really that's cool. Synchronicity, baby. That's all in the artist's way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's cool. One thing that I I mean I I was talking to my wife who's a yoga instructor and I was saying there's something nice about the quarantine as brutal as it is in other ways. But I do think the idea of mindfulness is real and the tools of mindfulness are in our culture. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they've been really surface kind of, we have a surface understanding of, you know, whatever, just like waiting and listening or silence or kind of meeting yourself. But I think the quarantine has been a nice opportunity for that for me. Like time, even though I have a two year old and I'm taking care of my in-laws too. Um, there are these moments of just long passages of just like me with my mind. Um, so I think maybe we're lucky in that, in that way. That's one of the, I don't know, the side blessings or whatever. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's Thanks great. Jeff. That was a great question. And great. And continue on with your projects, Jeff. That's fantastic. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Chris, you, you have a huge background in improv and, uh, did you, did you come up through the pit? Cause you referred to it. Yeah. Yeah, that was my main. I've taken some courses at UCB, but um, my, you know, I performed and taught and learned and studied at the pit for 10 years. And would you, when you were shooting the film that you made, were you, uh, were you improvising a lot or not? Or how did that work? No, we really didn't have time um, to improvise. There were things that would happen that like in the rehearsal, like back in the room and they were like, oh, we'll use that. Right. But there weren't just like, let's roll and see what happens. Um, right. Right. And but I mean, I think it, it totally affected the writing. You know, I, I treated the writing of the scenes in the same way that I would an improv scene in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so that was fun. And um, how many, the cast for the, for the film, how, how many of them were people that you had a history of working with before? Everybody. So that was another thing of like, we wanted to bring people that we knew would, would be up for it, you know, it would be yeah. fun. And, you know, we were sleeping in small rooms and working, you know, long, long hours. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, we wanted it to, be, it was sort of like a camp, you know, like right. a little film camp, okay. which was great. Just kind of finding your tribe nice of camp. people that you, you yeah. know, create with. And yeah. Seth and I are always talking about that. How are we able to kind of help people, you know, encourage them to kind of find their people and yeah. create with them. And that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of what, well, like obviously because of the virus and everything, it'll be a while before that another iteration of another film before the sequel yeah, yeah i know i can't even think about you know i don't even know yeah. and for for lots of other reasons too it was just like financially even though it was a small budget it was a, a lot for me and time and money kind of commit to it and um, what do you think the overall budget ended up being well this is a secret in case okay. anyone really wants to buy it All right. Um, but I'll trust everyone here. I think it was like $8,000 for pre-production. Wow. And then I think all said and done with post, maybe another six or something. So under 15,000, which is, and, you know, unheard of. It's a, it's a full, it's a feature, a feature length. I mean, what, yeah. how long is it? 86 minutes. Yeah. Right in the sweet spot. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and of course, like I said, a lot of people paid in equity or like, are paid in equity of the film. Yeah. And we have a, um, uh, what's it called? Kind of like a PR firm, 
attached mm -hmm. to us now. Mm -hmm. So they put money in um, that if we make any money, they get paid, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing like, or distri a distributor, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. That's um, there's, a, there's a question that was put in the chat. Um, okay. here. It says, um, did, did you read David Foster Wallace's essay from a cruise ship? Yeah. Um, that was, I, we, I, I mean, I, it was a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again, I think. <laughs> It's the title. Is that what it is? I, I don't know. I think is. so. Yeah, we read that. I I mean, I like David Foster Wallace. Um, I don't really remember much uh, about it. I I mean, I suspect. I think there, he, you know, there is a real sense of humanity on the cruise. It's like all the good things and all the bad things are just like smashed together. There's a there's a lot that's very gross about it. Um, we also, there's a film called Wadu Dem, which oh. was also filmed on it, partly on a cruise ship, but oh. they went like back into the crew quarters, oh. really kind of, um, you know, got some behind the scenes footage, which I'm not interested in taking those risks. Um, she also had a, another question. Um, mm -hmm. This is Anne Recht, I think. Uh, she said, uh, what was the hard, what did, you, what did you find the, what do you find the hardest thing with acting? Just, I, I guess that's a, mm. in, in general kind of a thing. I always have regrets about, oh, I should have done this. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a larger thing of like, oh, I had this idea, whatever, the spirit of the stairs or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. After you've left, it's like, ooh, that. Um, there is a, we, we got a review in the New York Times for this movie, um, which basically was like, it was like all my worst fears said to me by the New York Times about my acting. Oh. So I was sad for a day. Um, but then I was just like, yeah, I made a movie, you know? Yeah. The movie's still a movie. Um, but I, making this, I really didn't have time to think about my performance too, too much, which I guess was nice. Maybe it would be nice at some point to have a director who was like, oh, let's really try this or push me in certain ways. Mm -hmm. That's another thing I think I'm not good or I don't have the right um, kind of pedigree to be a good actor, but that's all like a mental game, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's another thing in, in Anne's chat to just, you know, for us to just take a, take a moment to acknowledge there was a, a death uh, where a gentleman was choked to death by a cop and uh, we just want to yeah. acknowledge that. It's a very obviously, a, a, um, mm. real and serious thing and, and uh, send our love to all the people that are on, you know, affected by that. It's, it's a, when, yeah, uh, I'm in the country kind of and I'm an hour out of the city mm -hmm. and there's a ton of like Blue Lives Matter people out here and I really have all these fantasies of, of fighting or, you know, making <laughs> some kind of statement mm -hmm. um, but I often just and I don't do anything. Um, it's a terrible place. So, yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, well, you know, right. awareness, one of my favorite saying is awareness is the first step. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so just keeping it in the conversation is, is a start to mm -hmm. addressing these things. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. um, Chris, believe it or not, that is our time. Wow. We just I believe it. That. Um, <laughs> But thank you so much uh, for doing this. Yeah. Thank you. You have such a very particular background and unique perspective. And I think it's so great for people to hear about how things get done like this. You right. Know? Yeah. My pleasure. Uh, this so is really I nice. I think, you know, we're going to uh, try to do a, a class also with Chris <laughs> in terms of oh, that's uh, right. story and uh, how to help people, you know, um, start their stories and finish their stories. And yeah. so that's, uh, we're going to. Yeah. Know, Chris has taught with our, we, in, in, uh, a, various programs that we've had going at the school. And, and uh, he has a really great uh, just approach when it comes to finishing power and finishing off things. And so we're really delighted to have him share that through the Bear Group's programming. Um, anyway, thanks, Chris. And thank you thank all you. for, yes, thank for you all tuning for... in today. And Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you know, everyone hanging out. Just the standard thing I'll say to everybody, just uh, 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 we have at beargroup.org, we have also all of our free programming posted. We've been doing um, weekly on Mondays a, a tea with Lee and, and myself. And then we have also um, a sample acting class on Tuesdays. 
And every Wednesday we have an uh, artist conversation. Is who's next week? Is it Leslie Kritzer? It is. Mm -hmm. Leslie Kritzer, musical theater star extraordinaire. She's just an incredible, uh, a Bear Group student actually. As is Chris. Yeah. Um, Chris. Yeah. Uh, and uh, um, we're just uh, delighted to see you all. And then we also have uh, not uh, not this coming Friday, but the next Friday. We're going to be sharing. I think that's it. Is that uh -huh. right? We're going to, is that when we're sharing the stories? We are. We're sharing stories. Uh, we have a project of restorative stories where we, where people have been sending in three to five minute stories, and uh, fantastic. There's really some great ones, so we're, yeah. we're really excited to share that with you all. And of course, we have our regular programming, which is all of our training and everything. So, um, welcome, uh, welcome. That. <laughs> Welcome to my life. <laughs> Welcome to my life in COVID, where I don't know whether I'm beginning or ending. Um, and uh, Porter Picard, thank you so much for uh, indeed. Yeah, you know you, producing this whole thing uh, this evening. And we hope that everyone is staying healthy and uh, calm and happy and practicing mindfulness and getting. And some Porter, sunshine. it looks like you're going to play us off. Yeah, uh, you're gonna play uh, off. you do not want to hear me try to. Play. Oh. <laughs> just, I'm a novice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll imagine. We're singing a song right there. We go. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank thanks for coming so by. And thank, thank you, Chris. You. Stay healthy thank you. And have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.